And in London, we're, you know, we're kind of thinking, oh, you know, gosh, how do we try and get the economy growing? What's our role in the world having left the European Union? How do we fit between the UK and the EU? So we tend to be more on the innovation side of the discussion or the research and development side of the discussion. On today's show, we've got two interviews to bring you. First, we're talking to Daisy, the COO of Corporate Entertainment Professionals, and then Darren Jones, MP, a Labour MP for Bristol Northwest and the chair of the Commons Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Committee. Why? Well, we're focusing on events, both small scale and large, with Web Summit last week in Portugal hosting 71,000 attendees. And whilst we're at it, how can the government support growing technology companies? This is Tech Talks, your weekly technology podcast brought to you by myself, David Savage, and powered by Nash Squared. Joining me today, we've got Akish. How are you? Hello, I'm very well. I'm very well. And also, we haven't started this episode with a load of uh, technical issues like we had last time. So, No, this is very true. You're near shore now. Near shore, back in the UK. Uh, yeah. Something dropped into our inboxes today. Uh, Christmas party. There we are. Yes. Christmas party. Yes. It is the 7th of November. Yes, I am. Yeah. Lovely. Okay. 7th of November, we had the invitation to our annual Christmas party. Tis the season of corporate shindigs. Corporate shindigs. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Looking forward to it. It's black tie. I am looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. You know me. Um, I think any, anyone that works in these corporate organizations, so you, you, well, I would say it, but I don't know if you can, but like, you know, anyone above any guy above the age of, I think, 23, 24, should always have a tux. It's one of those staple things in your like, wardrobe. It's like, it's like having a nice white shirt, you know? Yeah. Like, it's just one of those things you should just I've, have. I've got a DJ. I'm slightly worried about whether or not it fits because I haven't had it on in a couple of years. I can't remember the last time we had occasion yeah. to wear one. Yeah, but Dave, the problem is, mate, when you say it doesn't fit, it's because you've been running like a lunatic and it's probably big for you. When I say something doesn't fit, it means it doesn't even get above my forearms, mate. So <laughs> that's the difference. Still, it's still a problem. I, I literally, I went up to the loft earlier because we were at Parliament tomorrow for a work event launching the Digital Leadership Report. And I tried on a suit that I had for a wedding like three, four years ago, and it looks like clown pants. Yeah, well, that's your fault for eating fit and healthy and, and running loads, Okay. <laughs> Followed by okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> fatten up. Well, it's Christmas, mate, so I'm sure you'll be eating a load and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, it provides a lovely link though into today's first interview, which is with corporate entertainment professionals COO Daisy, where we're talking all about events and event season and how technology has helped their business. But stick around because after that, we've also then got an interview with Darren uh, Jones, MP and chair of the business energy and industry committee so loads to come we'll hand over to daisy we'll be back with some commentary afterwards so i'm chatting to daisy in maidstone it's always quite fun when, when the podcast isn't remote these days because ever since the pandemic like 90 percent of them aren't face to face so this is nice yeah it makes a change definitely better than zoom yes also quite funny that we've known each other for maybe five years i think so and only discovered that we live down the road from each other about six months, well, not even that long ago, no. six weeks ago. <laughs> Could have saved ourselves so many train trips, but... <laughs> yeah, and the fact that you looked on a ha- at a house on the same estate that I'm now living in. I know, it's almost fortuitous how paths are coming <laughs> together for this podcast. Um, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I was just saying that we're getting so busy for Halloween and Christmas, which is fantastic. You know, we're having our best year ever, but it is very, very busy. Might be good then to start with what you do, because it'll make a lot more sense as to why you're busy right now once people know what the company does. So um, we're CEP, Corporate Entertainment Professionals, and we are an entertainment agency. We provide live entertainment um, acts from promo models, still walkers, fire artists. We've got giant props like a giant aerial birdcage, the largest in the world. We've got every costume imaginable in our warehouse, and we create these live entertainment acts which can go and delight customers at our clients' events. And you're the Chief Operating Officer? I am, yes. How long have you been here? Um, I joined two weeks after the pandemic was announced. Yeah? <laughs> and um, yeah, so a few years now, but with my best friend and business partner, Sammy, who is CEO. Great timing to join a physical events organisation. Yes, there was a definite panic moment, but I know that I made the right decision because I came into business with my best friend and someone who I know is an excellent businesswoman. What does a COO do at an events company? So <laughs> it's kind of a catch-all term for what I do. I do the marketing, database management. 
I also do the HR in the company. Mm -hmm. um, I deal with the legal side of things with our solicitors. I actually get involved in the financial side of things as well in terms of fun financial forecasts and strategy. And then I also do operations. So I'll look at the logistics of the events and then all of that tied together. Simply, I streamline all processes that I can so that we spend less time on admin and more time on revenue generating activities. So I do a lot of automation building through Zapier, connecting our software systems and trying to cut out the middle sort of admin processes. It's fair to say that Sammy is kind of the, the lightning rod for ideas. Yes. <laughs> and then you kind of bring some of those slightly more down to, all right, what's practical, what's workable? Yeah, so Sammy and I are definitely yin and yang. She has a thousand ideas a minute, which is fantastic. She's very creative and very good at what she does, and she's been doing it for a long time. But she will come to me and say, I want to do this, I want to buy that, we should do this, we should do that, I've got an idea for this, and it's fantastic. And I will sit down and go, right, let's put that into a spreadsheet, let's figure out what the ROI could be, let's figure out what we need to do to make that happen, which of these ideas should we focus on when, and then put it into motion. So as a COO of a, of a company that's not pivoted, in fact, you did the opposite of that because you stuck to your guns in terms of what it was that the business did. Yeah. But I suppose hit a bit of a reset button. Yes. What kind, of, what kind of tools have you been able to use to help you scale and be more efficient? So it's, it's strange because when I joined, um, we had uh, another member of staff in the office dealing with sales. And we had two people working on costumes, packing costumes, maintaining them, etc. And then Sammy leading the sales and uh, business development. So when I came on board, initially, I was just getting a feel for the business, seeing what the existing processes were and just analysing before I really jumped in. Mm -hmm. Then obviously we found out about the pandemic and we had to make very serious changes and we had to unfortunately make um, that other office member redundant, which was very sad. And we had to sell our van, we had to get rid of our lockup, all the costumes went inside our houses, and there's a lot of costumes. Um, you know, it, we had to streamline a lot, but we luckily had reserves we could dip into. We managed to get a couple of small grants from the council, and we just spent that time rebuild, rebranding, rebuilding our website, and building a CRM that could cope with where we wanted to take the business. So in a way, it was a blessing that we had this time where we weren't focusing on day-to-day -day running of the business because nothing was happening. And we were able to actually really look at what is our company, who are the clients we want to get, how do we get them, and then build all the processes to do that. So yes, but it was in a way I'm trying to look at it as a blessing that we had that time to do it because I think if we hadn't and I'd just it would be a much longer process and we wouldn't be necessarily at the progress we are now. Yeah. So how important is it for you as a small business then? I mean, how far ahead do you plan? Because I, I suppose with events, it's very seasonal, as yes. you alluded to. And I can totally understand that you're forecasting for, all right, what does Halloween look like? What does Christmas look like? I suppose to an extent, what would be the next big one? Maybe Easter? I don't know. No, yeah, you're right. We are very seasonal. In fact, the way that our revenue goes through the year is actually some people's kind of, kind of goes up and down whereas ours starts low at january and just builds and builds and builds as it gets mm. towards christmas and then it dips again in january so a lot of event companies that or agencies that will book through us as we're a supplier um, or clients when they come to us direct will find that a lot of their budget for the year is for christmas and that kind of time of year but then we do work with shopping centers and festivals over summer so um, we do have more time at the start of the year to sort of plan, but in terms of how we, how far we plan ahead, Sammy and I do have are looking at like five year plans. We sit have sat down with a um, a financial strategist in terms of looking at the value of the company and where we want to take it, and we are on track to become a seven figure business. But in a previous life, you you founded and were editor of the Startups magazine. Yes. How much of those interviews and talking to People who have ran those businesses, have you taken and applied to what you're doing now? All of it. That's the reason I'm here. I I started it as this project that kind of became a passion project that just I got sort of swept up in. And it was an amazing journey. But when you're every day interviewing these amazing, talented, brave people that have started their own businesses and they are able to take their idea, bring it to fruition, and they're the ones steering the boat, you can't help but kind of get 
bitten by that same bug and I just felt like their energy was infectious and I just was so inspired by them. I knew that I wanted to do something of my own as well and that I wanted to go into business with um, Sammy, who we met fortuitously through a business coach and it just happened very organically. And I knew that I wanted to be putting that same amount of energy into something that was mine. So what what lessons have you got then? Because let's let's face it, community and understanding and kind of learning off of people who are running businesses is, is such a valuable tool. But if, what lessons have you taken from the last year or so, two, well, three years actually, thinking about kind of the beginning of the pandemic, that you would pass on to someone else to say, actually, here's a moment to pause and edit and maybe not fall down this trap? So I think so my advice on this sort of um, topic changes as I learn more and more. At the moment, um, I find that my best advice is work based on your energy. So, for example, if I've, because I'm very, I love productivity hacks and all of that sort of stuff. I read a lot, lot of books along those lines, like Eat the Frog and different ways of organising your to-do lists, um, because I like to get stuff done. That's just who I am. So my advice is pay attention to your energy levels and work based on that. So, for example, if you've got your to-do list, divide it based on how much energy each of those tasks is. And for me, I just use like a little lightning bolt system, three for high energy, one for low. And then I know if I'm having a high energy morning, I will dive straight into those high energy products, those high energy tasks. Whereas if I'm feeling like, oh, a bit like I want to, you know, when you're procrastinating a little bit or your head is full, you just tick off as many of those low energy tasks as you can. And I find that is the most productive way of getting a lot of stuff done in a day. Um, so I think in terms of like just getting stuff done, that would be my advice for that. In terms of like the larger picture of where you're taking your business and how you look at your business, I've learned so much from Sammy about taking risks. Not that I've ever been hugely risk averse, but this woman is on another level. So I've definitely learned to be very ballsy and to just take leaps of faith and go, you know, we'll throw X amount of money at this project and we'll obviously plan it as we need to, but we're going to take the leap and see where this gets us. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, this is where we want to be. And so we just, obviously you work back from there and plan your steps, but it's kind of having the faith to go, we will get there. And you just have to go forward with that energy in mind. Because if you're in your head, dousing yourself you're not going to get there if you're thinking oh I don't know if this is going to work but you're still trying it's not the right attitude it's all or nothing obviously you're leading a team you're building that team back mm -hmm. up totally understand what you're saying around kind of being aware of your energy what do you think <laughs> what how do you how do you think you respond when possibly your team are on a different energy level to you so Team culture is something that is very important to me, um, especially based on, you know, my previous career experience has been interesting, whereas, you know, I've had times when I've been working so hard that I would have panic attacks and things like that, and I'd never had those in my life. I thought they were, like, a PR term. And um, now I, when you have one, you realise it's a very real thing, and it's your body telling you to slow down, and it's... For me, I never want to put any of my staff in that position. I never want them to feel like they haven't got enough hours in the day to do what they're doing. Because as far as I'm concerned, if they don't feel like that they can take their lunch break, if they feel like they have to stay two, three hours later at the end of the day, I'm doing something wrong. That's on me. Because mm -hmm. I'm either giving them something they're not trained to do efficiently, and I need to give them more training, or I'm giving them too much work, which means that's a sign that we're ready to scale. So for me, that's always an indicator. I'm watching... Um, how much time they spend on things we occasionally will do a time tracking round where they'll track what their tasks are for a week and then I can look at it and analyse it um, yeah team culture we have a lot of companies say they're fun and it's very overused term and it's often not true their idea of fun is we have donuts on a Friday <laughs> whereas I can genuinely say we are a fun office like we um, we're a serious office we get stuff done but you if you walk in on any given day the chances are that we're all singing a Disney song together, we're having a laugh, we're doing um, something silly to put on social media. There's a really nice energy in the office at all times and people know that they work hard but we do reward them. We have monthly targets and if we hit them, everyone succeeds, not just the sales team because they've got their own commission structure too. 
but we we've got um, a lucky dip jar. Yeah. And they all get to pull um, a piece of paper out, and it could be like you know fifty pounds or a voucher or a facial or whatever, something like that, based on what they've said that they would like. So we try and take that into account. And we're very flexible on working hours and things like that. So I'm always aware of trying to build this team culture where people know that it's not stuffy. They can come talk to me at any time that they need to. And I feel, I personally feel like they enjoy what they do. Um, I hope they'd say the same. And we do have uh, regular meetings where we come together and you know they, they have a chance to voice any concerns they might have. And, yeah. yeah. Favourite Disney song? Favourite Disney song? Oh, where to start? Well, I'm a true romantic, so probably <laughs> the one from Sleeping Beauty, Once Upon a Dream. <laughs> <laughs> a classic. Yeah. Uh, look, so um, it's probably well known to you already, but people are very much wanting to get back in person, run events. I mean, Web Summit is in, at the time of recording, two weeks away. No, just over a week away, actually. And they have had the fastest selling um event ever 70,000 tickets sold out so that's good news for the events industry yes. and everything else that hangs off it so if someone is looking to run an event and they would like to make it that slightly or give it a slightly more uh, interesting edge how would they get in touch with you guys they can go to our website which is the hyphen cep.com or they can email me at daisy d-a-i-s-y at the hyphen cep.com and we've got so much to offer it's I could it, I could spend hours telling you about all the different acts we've got but the best thing to do is tell us what your event is. And um, what we do best is we create and design bespoke entertainment. So we'll tell you what we think will work the best for you because we're the experts in entertainment. So we take the pressure off of you and we suggest the acts that will work best to your event. Yeah. So yeah, drop us an email. We'll take you for coffee and have a chat. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Right, for me, there's, there's a lot here to, to love because mm. they're, not, they're, not a, they're not a technology company per se right at all and they're not even a startup sammy um daisy's uh kind of co-lead the ceo to her coo had been running this business for years but the pandemic provided a reset opportunity and they basically built the crm they they hit pause it gave them space to think about who are we um, what customers do we want to work with and they built out those processes and um and i love that that technology has really been there at the heart of their relaunch or rebirth post pandemic which is weird right because i wouldn't associate uh an events company that that would rely so much on like technology in all kinds of things like keeping details that sort of stuff i if i look at an events company I, I think it's all about like relationships and you know knowing owners of of you know companies organizations knowing the best venues the best I don't know, lighting, sounds, like, but then when you actually start to think, which when you listen to the interview, you actually start to think how many things, like if you, like you've planned a wedding, right? Um, I have. So, yeah. so, so it's like, it's like, you know, when you, when you actually begin to list down. Well, hang on. My wife planned a wedding. Oh, well, you were part of it, consulted, or at least your credit card may have been consulted. I was consulted, consulted occasionally. Yeah, 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 exactly. So it's like A when you begin. Yeah, when you begin to think like how many things are needed, mm. like you know, it, it, and it's ridiculous. Like organisations, if they had to remember, if they had to keep, if they had to track all that information, they would track it using technology. They would track it on workflows. They would track it on, you know, whatever system or platform, right, that they have. And the fact that they kind of their whole rebirth, if you want to call it that, was technology flavoured, and you know, with that as a as an absolute like you know center point no i think yeah. it's great yeah. and sammy who's obviously the ideas person as, as daisy talks about brought in daisy who as coo as someone who was entrenched in the tech startup system ecosystem rather had had been the founder of startups magazine and had kind of picked up this infectious entrepreneurial spirit from them and and has put it into into practice at CEP, which is which is fantastic. There's some great advice in there as well for founders. You know, if you're looking across any kind of area of the technology market, advice around you know work based on your energy. I think work based on your energy is is a really nice simple piece of advice. And I also liked the point that she made about you know if your staff have to stay for two or three hours behind extra, you know, are you managing them properly? 
Uh, are they as trained as they should be? That, to a degree, flies in the face a little bit of the mantra of the kind of the startup nose to the grindstone kind of hustle image that has pervaded the industry for several years. And again, might be in part a little bit of the the reset process that we've gone through with the pandemic. Yeah, it, it, it's crazy, right? Because that comes out on the week that we've seen Twitter employees go to sleep in their like on their floor, right? Like in the office, yeah. and and you know you kind of think that. Okay, well, maybe, yeah, it is that. And and that, I mean, it, that triggered quite a lot with me. And, you know, um, we're in the sales kind of um, industry. There are some long nights, there are some earlier starts. And, you know, I'm not shy of that and admitting that um, to anyone new who starts or whatever. But then it does go back to the whole, like, even the age old thing of, like, work smart. You know, are you being as smart? Are you... Do you have all the tools that you need in order for you to get your job done so you can get it done within those kind of working hours? Mm. Or are you spending are you spending those working hours actually trying to find out the information that you need to get the job done? Which then does that mean you're getting crap management? I don't know. I hope my team don't think that, but you know. Uh... I'll, I'll make sure a as soon moment as I of self-reflection yeah I don't know, I'm, I'm literally saying going, oh shit um, it's 5.29 do you know what as soon as we finish this I'm going to tell them go home uh, <laughs> so, yeah but yeah that's um, crazy and what do you think about working working to your you're based on your energy that's something I totally relate to like I am useless at certain times of the day and then I come alive at others and I've just learned to accept it you are and we've had this conversation before that that, that optimum time for you like there's a bit of a lull in the afternoon, isn't it? Like, is it three p.m. or something like that? Yeah, two, you, you, three you, o'clock. You're I'm not, not very good. I'm two, not, three o'clock. We've had this conversation. Anyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you kind of just have a second wind, almost like a boxer. Um, yeah, you have the second wind and you're ready to go. But I, I, I like that, man. I, I like that. But I, I think also, I think that involves someone being very secure within their own kind of processing and within their own thinking that they know what time is good and what not. Um, because you get a lot of organizations that say, Oh, like, you know, you keep reading things about a four day working week and that sort of thing. But what if, you know, Monday to Thursday doesn't work for people. What if people work better on a Friday? So how are you going to do that? Like, do you know what I mean? It's just, I think people need to, people need to be open on what suits them and organizations should then embrace that and say, right, well, if you work better here, then let's kind of use you for that time sort of thing. Mm. Um, that's what I would say. Now, one events company to a different type of event. We were, we were in Lisbon last week for Web Summit. We have got an absolute truckload of content coming your way next week. We got about 30 interviews whilst we were out there. But one of them that we wanted to share this week is Darren Jones, MP, um, chair of the uh, Business Energy Industry Select Committee. We're sharing it, A, because it ties in, you know, we've just had Web Summit. It's hot on the on the heels of Web Summit. 71,000 attendees shows that there is so much appetite for for in-person events, um, you know, both on the, on the scale that we were talking about with regards to Christmas parties, people getting together, but also sharing ideas. Um, I mean, it's really interesting to hear right now from someone... Uh, who who is at the heart of maybe not government because he's in opposition obviously but working very much with government and across parliament to try and make sure that there is the right environment for companies like daisies and sammy's to thrive right mm. yeah absolutely and i think um i, I think first we should probably make it clear that the person um you know on the interview he's an mp in england um for our yes, global sorry, listeners. listeners yes. Yeah. When we say Parliament, when we say MP, yeah, good point. MP. We are talking about we are talking about the House of Commons in the United Kingdom. House of Commons, you know that old building with the green sofas in that you might see every now and then on yeah. TV. <laughs> if you're an American and you're listening, uh, it's it's our version of the House of Representatives. Yeah, basically. Um, I completely forgot your question there. I was trying to rinse him. You know, <laughs> I was, it, it was to talking about the fact MP. that. He's, he's providing, they're providing the environment for, for startups to thrive. You know, he talks very much about the need for stability that supports investment. He talks about the fact that the UK needs to work out um, what our role is. I think that's actually a really interesting point, just quickly whilst, whilst I'm rabbiting on. He talks about the role of the UK 
Um, he talks about the Brussels effect for the EU. He talks about the US and working out their relationship with China. And he's like, we're trying to work out where we sit in the world, but that means that we're doubling down on innovation and research, which is, I suppose, for someone who is I, very anti-Brexit and very anti, uh, basically, the current establishment, it's good that that has led to an environment where innovation and research is being doubled down on something where we can add value. I think it's massive, right? And, and the thing is... <sighs> With MPs, with politicians, because I remember, you, like, I think the start of the interview, you said something like, "Oh, it's not often you see, uh, you know, a politician, um, you know, kind of like." Oh no, a, no, a, no! Webster, there's like barely this. any. There's very yeah, few. Yeah, exactly right. And, and also, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I wasn't there yet again, but um, there wasn't <laughs> there wasn't a big logo on him saying, "I am a politician," was there? Um, well, so, he was wearing a suit and tie. I love Darren, but yeah. You know, oh, well, um, well, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, did, he um, didn't look tech on that front. <laughs> oh, he didn't. Okay, well, fair enough. Darren, next time, pack some chinos and a shirt. Um, but what I guess what I'm trying to say, it's good to see. It's good to see politicians saying, like, you know, we are backing this. We are we are backing this cause, or we are backing industry, innovation, research. Because when you hear about things in our government, um, and you hear about, you know, oh, we're going to be going through a recession or we, we need to bounce back. We need to level up. We need to do this. Like, how? You know, how, how are we going to do this? What, are we just going to keep borrowing? Or uh, what, is that growth yeah. going to come organically? And if it is going to become organically, then it has to come from the economy or it has to come from our founders, our tech leaders, our organizations that we grow and cultivate in the UK. Also, what was refreshing? I mean, this was a, this was a non-party... Um, influenced yeah. interview right yeah. but none of that language crept in mm. it was and it, you got the, the clear sense that he yeah. enjoys working with his colleagues across the political spectrum and this was this was about him listening understanding he talks about that understanding is is the safety bill the internet safety bill still fit for purpose let's go and find out what the industry is talking about and make sure yeah. that when we're legislating it actually is legislating the right stuff that will work Mm, yeah i i I like that and in bit of a bit of a just a fact check right and does our policies or do our policies actually protect us from growing or are they hindering us from you know exponential growth or are they stopping us and if they are stopping then get them reviewed darren and you know get it sorted um because as as far as i know mr sunak he's, he's in office and he wants to you know be different to the ones that were before him so be different get it sorted and uh away we go yeah well look let's i think we've had enough trailers there uh mm. spoilers rather so let's uh hand over to darren himself and let the listeners hear what he has to say akish thank you for joining me on today's episode thank you and we will be back next week with our 500th show and a special reviewing that truckload of content from web summit so it's lunchtime and I'm very lucky to be joined by Darren Jones, MP. How are you? Very good, thanks. Uh, you are here, well, you spoke this morning yeah. about regulation. You're here to find out a little bit about what's going on. You're one of very few politicians at Web Summit. First of all, why do you think that is? Why are, not, why are there not more politicians here? It's a great question. As, you know, Part of the feedback I want to give to Web Summit is they should probably try to encourage more of us to come. Uh, I was invited to speak because we were talking about legislation and how we might regulate technology companies. And so I joined colleagues from Washington, D.C. and Brussels to take a kind of U.S., U.K., E.U. view, uh, which I was very happy to do. Um, But I'm also here because I get to listen to what's happening at the cutting edge of technology, especially in this kind of startup innovation space, um, which is very helpful because politicians need to kind of understand what's happening if you're then also trying to regulate in those areas and uh, we're often a bit behind the curve the lack of talks on regulation is it a reflection that the pace of change is so fast in technology that perhaps rightly or wrongly the industry is is so locked into self-regulation mode that they're not really thinking necessarily of legal lags and and and, and the thoughts around what government might be able to provide you know, it's a great it's a great question. I don't know whether there's a lack of talk on it because it's not interesting or it's not relevant. I think it is interesting, but it's that question of what can it do right now? I, I don't know. Yeah, I, so I don't know the answer to the to the question. My my sense though is that if you're working in lots of these spaces, you really ought to understand what's going on in the regulatory space, and not because we want to 
burden companies with red tape or compliance, but because, let's take for example online safety, yeah. we always say we want companies to think of safety by design. So from the very start of the kind of journey, we want innovators to be thinking about the safety of their, of their products. Um, so it's probably better for us to be here in the mix talking to people at the very start of their innovation cycle when they're in a startup phase before they've spent, I don't know, $50 million building something that then might not comply with regulation uh, later, down the, later down the line. There are a lot of startups here. Obviously, there's, there's some squeeze on investment at the moment. Um, I know even from, a, from an enterprise point of view, money is... It's turning away slightly from innovation and more towards infrastructure and perhaps there's less investment going on in, in that regard. As a member of, of Parliament, what can you do to try and work with the private sector to encourage them to keep investing? Because in my mind, that would be the way out of the slightly tricky economic situation we find ourselves in at the moment. Yeah, look, certainly from a UK perspective, we're very conscious of that because we want people to start up in the UK. We like... Uh, the successes we've had in the startup space, whether they're university spin-outs or, or otherwise. And it's something that in the UK we're particularly good at globally. So we want to create that ecosystem uh, for startups to be able to thrive. And that includes investment as well. The, you, you will know the challenge we often have in, in the UK is actually scale-up finance as opposed to startup finance. Uh, and so, you know, the government and the Labour Party in opposition thinking about the next election and others... Uh, you know, are actively talking about startups because we recognise the importance of them. How interesting is it for you to be able to sit there and, and talk to peers from Washington, other countries, and get their perspective? Because at the minute, because of events, we've probably been quite insular of late. There's been a lot of, of change in Westminster. I suppose that's taken a lot of energy. It must be quite refreshing to be able to get a, your head up and look around. It is, but it's quite useful to distinguish between the kind of political and the practical. Yeah. So at official level, there's you know there's long been collaboration and there continues to be. You know, a great example of that is on competition and antitrust policy. The Federal Trade Commission, the Competition Markets Authority, DG Comp in Brussels, you know, continue to work together on thinking about uh, competition and antitrust measures. Um, politically, we're all trying to answer slightly different questions, but that's at a very kind of macro political level. So obviously the attention in Washington at the macro political level is the geopolitical race between China and the West, and a lot of attention is going into that. Uh, in Brussels, uh, it's about um, you know, how do you continue the Brussels effect in terms of regulation, building on GDPR, trying to set standards that protect citizens and consumers around the world. And in London, we're, you know, we're kind of thinking, oh, you know, gosh, how do we try and get the economy growing? What's our role in the world having left the European Union? How do we fit between the UK and the EU? So we tend to be more on the innovation side of the discussion or the research and development side of the discussion. So we're trying to answer different questions at the political level, but at the operational level, there is a lot of collaboration and overlap already. And so it's nice to, to be able to continue those discussions with allies and friends. But one of the things that you realize when you come to Web Summit is this industry is vast. Um, with the National Square Digital Leadership Report, I looked at some of the results that we've got from our own survey, very much talking around the fact that data is still the gem of the industry, um, where, where investment is, is around data, automation, and AI. You come here, people are talking about Web3, they're talking about green tech and blue tech around sustainability. You only have so many hours in a day, there are only so many members of parliament, you have lots of other noise going on. Where do you think you need to put your attention and time at the moment to try and help the industry and to make sure that it that it is regulated and, and working for people? Oh, that's a great question. I suppose there are two angles to it. I mean, the way in which my schedule has been put together for being here for a day at Web Summit, not for the whole week, is reflective of what we're working on in Parliament, probably, as opposed to the other way around. So, you know, I'm keen to understand from a Facebook oversight perspective uh, and a metaverse perspective whether the online safety bill is still kind of heading in the right direction or not. I'm keen to understand from a uh, Web3 perspective whether our regulatory institutions and our bodies are set up in a way that can still provide economic stability whilst allowing this innovation to happen. And I said on the National Security Joint Committee in Parliament, we're looking at ransomware and cryptocurrencies at the moment, so I'm going to have some meetings and some uh, events I'm going to on you know, cryptocurrencies to try to help me understand how these things work. So that's where my attention is. You asked a slightly different question at the end, though, which is what should the government be doing to help business um, in, in the UK? Um, and I think, you know, I think we probably need some political stability. Um, I think we probably need a bit of clarity about 
how UK regulation is going to deviate or not from European regulation and how much of that is actually feasible because we're still within the regulatory orbit of the EU and probably being a bit honest about about that we're not we're not going to be able to just stop doing GDPR we're not going to be able to just you know take a very different approach on competition policy because we still have certain commitments as a trading partner and so I think probably political stability that supports investment it's probably the place that the government needs to be in. But look, I appreciate you giving up some time. It's fitted it in after your talk at the end of lunch, hence yeah. it being nice and buzzy in here. But I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and uh, get something positive out of being in Lisbon. Thanks for having me.